first Elisa's ADAT was introduced in March 1992. It recorded eight tracks of 16-bit digital audio on a standard SVHS tape at either 44.1 or 48 kilohertz sample rates. Up to 16 ADATs could be synchronized via the rear 9-pin port. They sold for $39.95 when introduced and revolutionized the 90s project studio. This video will help archivists understand what's happening under the hood. The original ADAT became known as the Blackface when it was later replaced by the XT version. The Fostex RD8 is built on the same platform as the Blackface but with a cream front panel. An enhanced menu screen allows access to additional features. The ADAT XT featured an improved transport and power supply. It is identical to the Fostex CX8 aside from the front panel color. The 20-bit models include the standard XT20, the budget LX20, the upscale M20, and the sexy Euro version known as the Studer V8. Panasonic made the transport in the latter two models. Assuming your ADAT survives the boot sequence, but before inserting a tape, let's check mechanical basics, starting with the reel tables. The spring-loaded reel table assembly is press-fit together, but it can pop, eliminating vertical clearance and causing friction in the process. There should be some room for up and down vertical travel. Next is the reversing idler made from either black or yellow orange synthetic rubber. It is easily removed for cleaning or replacement. The rubber should be pliable, not hard. The spring that holds the clip in place also applies pressure to the knurled brass reel motor shaft. The felt beneath the idler causes enough friction so that motor direction swings the idler to either the supply or take-up tables for rewind, play, and fast-forward. Note the belt that links the take-up reel table to the motion sensor, a magnetic wheel that converts motion into electronic pulses, as this video shows. The pulse frequency corresponds to the take-up reel table speed. This is one of the many sensors that report back to the microprocessor. Other sensors include an infrared transmitter in the center. The right red arrow points to the beginning of tape sensor, and the left red arrow points to the end of tape sensor, both of which are mounted to the loading elevator. Also mounted to the loading elevator are switches to tell the processor whether the elevator is up or down. At lower left are two switches, one that confirms when the tape has been loaded, and the other to report that the tape is either right protected or not. As if this weren't enough, on the underside of the transport at lower left, the mode switch monitors the tape threading process. Other items of note are the capstan belt and the thread motor belt. From the moment a tape is inserted, if any sensor does not report when it should, the ADAT will stop and report an error message. Belts and pinch rollers are available through third-party vendors, and switches can be cleaned, but no manufacturer support is available. For helical heads, 99% isopropyl alcohol is applied, either to a lint-free cloth or, in a pinch, paper. Either can be cut into strips suitable for the format, small for DAT, medium for DTRS, and large for ADAT. Cotton swabs can be used for the linear head and tape path. The rotary head must come to a complete stop before applying the cloth to the drum, which must only be turned counterclockwise. A second dry cloth can be applied, but please allow time for the alcohol to evaporate. It is important to familiarize yourself with ADAT normal, of how the tape threads and how the transport handles breaking from fast wind. The tape path may look a bit sloppy, but the only way to know for sure is to connect an oscilloscope to these test points. BG delay for oscilloscope synchronization and read in, otherwise known as the RF envelope. The signal from tape should look something like this. However, grabbing video from a complex oscilloscope may cause motion sickness, so here's a freeze frame and a block diagram. The entrance and exit guides are adjustments that correspond to the left and right side of the A and B head waveforms. The freeze frame points to the exit side of the A-head where you can see a repetitive blip in the next video clip which corresponds to a piece of lint that is stuck to the exit guide roller. It's hard to see the 8-tracks as they are represented in the 20-bit RF envelope as compared to the 16-bit version. But here is the record signal being sent to tape one track at a time. 
The difference between the A and B head signals is track order. On one head, the tracks are in sequential order. One, 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 one two, two, three, three four, 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 five, five, five six, 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 seven, seven, seven eight. eight. The B head tracks are staggered so that entrance and exit guide anomalies don't trash the redundant signal. Next up, use a 0.89 millimeter hex wrench to loosen the locking screw. The post roller tool optimizes the exit guide height for the right side of the envelope. The entrance roller optimizes the left side of the envelope. With the introduction of the XT, pressing set locate and record enable 3 accesses the error rate display. Many things affect error rate, tape condition, mechanical alignment, and PG delay, a software adjustment that aligns the head switching pulse to the transition between the A and B heads. The oscilloscope is set to 10 times magnification. The PG delay value is reset every time the head is changed and should have been noted somewhere within the deck. The ADAT format records a sync pulse via linear head that is mechanically adjusted to maximize the signal from tape. Changing the linear head position affects the error rate and flashes a red warning star. The DAT and DTRS formats embed this information within the RF envelope. Here you can see how changing the linear head position affects RF amplitude. You can also see how oxide buildup on the stationary portion of the helical head reduces RF output. This is a close-up of a DTRS head detailing the rabbit, which can be cleaned with a sharpened toothpick soaked in alcohol. Here are some suggestions for transferring ADAT tapes. Using an external thermometer to confirm dehydrator accuracy, bake tapes in advance at 130 degrees Fahrenheit for a few hours as needed. Preheat the tapes to 101 degrees Fahrenheit just before transfer. Capture at the native sample rate into the workstation via optical cable. The workstation should be slaved to the ADAT. The following video shows the importance of selecting the correct sample rate. An incorrect setting will cause the sample rate window to blink, resulting in a transfer at the incorrect speed or worse, a distorted signal plus a lovely error message. Considering that modular digital multitracks, both the Elisa's ADAT and Tascam's DTRS format, allowed multiple machines to be synchronized, the question arises as to whether tape and machine condition will allow multiple tapes to be transferred at once. The ability to extract MIDI timecode from the 9-pin connector allows multiple session tapes to be captured one at a time and in sync. If a problem tape arises, it is possible to back up and punch into a capture, smoothing out the edits after the fact. When capture and editing are completed, consolidate so that all tracks are the same length. Motu and RME still manufacture hardware, and JL Cooper products are available on the used market. These final clips show the location of the Record Protect tab and how to access hidden features one-handed whilst holding the camera. While this video may have fried some brain cells, it opens the door to several topics that could be explored in more depth. Feel free to share your needs in the comments section. Thanks to Jason Bittner for his tips on synchronization and temperature, and thank you for watching. Be sure to check out my other videos on the DAT and DTRS formats.